Hello everyone. I hope all of you are keeping well amid this pandemic. I pray for a speedy and healthy recovery to all those people affected with this disease. Today, we are here for the seventh talk in Coherence Lecture Series by Professor Abhishek Dar, who has been kind enough to accept our invitation. I welcome you all on behalf of Team D Coherence to today's talk. In this lecture series, we will hear from renowned physicists who are actively involved in the research in particular areas of physics so that everyone gets introduced to the various areas in physics and ongoing researches, research methodologies in those areas. Professor Abhishek Dal is a physicist specializing in statistical physics and condensed matter physics. He is a professor in the International Center for Theoretical Sciences, Bangalore. Professor Abhishek, Abhishek Dar's research is focused on understanding how the macroscopic laws of physics, such as Fourier's law of heat conduction, emerge from microscopic laws, such as those given by classical and quantum mechanics. He is also interested in the foundations of statistical mechanics in understanding large deviations and rare events in physical processes and the measurement problem of quantum mechanics. Professor Dar worked under Professor Deepak Dar for his PhD at the Tata Institute of Fundamental Research, Mumbai. His postdoc positions were at the Indian Institute of Science, the Raman Research Institute, and the University of California. Before joining ICTS, he was a faculty member at the Raman Research Institute. He was awarded the ICTP Prize in 2008 and the Shanti Bhatnagar Prize in Physical Sciences in 2009 for his insightful as well as rigorous results in classical and quantum transport in low dimensional systems and his seminal contributions to non equilibrium fluctuation theorems. He is a fellow of Indian Academy of Sciences an editorial and an editorial board member at Pramana and Journal of Statistical Physics. Before we start, I urge all of you to use the chat box of Zoom to ask questions. If there are any urgent questions, they'll be taken immediately. If not, they'll be taken at the end. Without further ado, I request Professor Abhishek Dar to take over. Uh, <clears throat> okay, uh, can you hear me? Yes, sir. Yeah, okay. Uh, so thanks, uh, Rishik, for the introduction. And uh, I would also like to thank the uh, organizers uh, for inviting me to give this talk. Uh, so, uh, yeah, it's a bit strange to giving, uh, like you can't hear, see anyone, uh, but okay, I hope I can convey like uh, what is exciting about heat conduction. I mean, uh, uh, so this is something I've been doing for the last 20 years and uh, uh, obviously it's exciting and uh, hopefully I'll try to convey some of the excitement uh, to you. Okay, so uh, okay, so let's, so actually, you can uh, stop me. I mean, I, I just want to make sure that you understand because uh, I mean, online it's more difficult to communicate. So if you have questions, I mean that, uh, I mean if you're not able to follow us, then please uh, uh, stop and ask uh, at any time. Okay, so basically the outline of my uh, of the talk is as follows. I'll give an introduction and basically try to explain what is really the interesting question. Uh, and basically, uh, I'll try to explain something called uh, anomalous heat transport in one-dimensional systems. Uh, and uh, so this will uh, talk about various classes of one-dimensional systems. So there are things called disordered harmonic lattices. And uh, then, uh, uh, so uh, yeah, so disordered harmonic lattices and then anharmonic lattices. These are the two broad classes where uh, you want to understand transport. And uh, and then what we'll see is that uh, this anomalous transport, I mean, so normal diffusive transport, you think of like heat uh, does diffusion, which uh, at a microscopic level, if you think about it, it's uh, like the heat carriers are doing a random walk, right? But uh, what we'll find is that uh, the uh, diffusion equation is not valid uh, for this anomalous systems. And then what you need is something called a Levy walk to describe uh, the walk. So instead of a random walk, you have a Levy walk. And I'll try to explain this uh, kind of description. Uh, and uh, then there's a more recent uh, uh, theory which tries to understand this, uh, 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 this physics of anomalous heat transport based on fluctuating hydrodynamics. And, and I'll try to explain the basic ideas. And then we will uh, have some discussion. 
Okay, so uh, okay, so what is uh, heat? Let's just start with what is uh, basically heat conduction. So heat transfer, uh, we know that from a hot body to a cold body can take place by various means: conduction, convection, and radiation. These are the three main uh, methods. Uh, and in convection, you have like the whole uh, fluid kind of moves from one region to another. Radiation, you don't need a medium. It's like electromagnetic waves uh, which carry the heat or the energy from a hot to a cold region. And conduction, it's uh, like if you have water, then the water is not moving, but it's still, con uh, so it's without any motion. If, uh, and if there's a medium, uh, this transfer of heat, then it's called conduction. Right, so this is an experiment many of you do, like you take a rod or something and put one end at uh, ice and the other end at, uh, in steam. And so one end is hot and cold. And uh, then you, what you'll find is that they, obviously there's some heat current going through the system. And then you can, for example, put a thermometer at various places and measure the temperature. And so you'll get a temperature profile uh, that looks like this. Okay, so T left is the hot end, T right is the cold end, and there's some intermediate temperature at all points. Okay, so this is the basic uh, physical uh, uh, measurement that you are doing. You're just measuring heat uh, current in a system connected to different temperatures, right? Okay, so now uh, there's this famous Fourier's law, uh, which uh, basically tells, I mean, so if there is, uh, so you need a temperature difference. So the temperature gradient basically causes a heat current. And Fourier's law basically says that uh, it is just proportional to the gradient in temperature, right? So the current is proportional to gradient of temperature and the proportionality constant is the thermal conductivity of that material, right? So uh, it's a material, I mean, so this thermal conductivity is supposed to uh, tell you like uh, dif differentiate be between different systems. It's just some number uh, with some dimensions. Uh, that is supposed to be material specific, okay? So this is Fourier's law of heat conduction. And if you use this Fourier's law, it gives you the heat current density in a system. Uh, if you use the fact that energy is locally conserved, uh, which you can write as a continuity equation like this. So epsilon is the, let's say the energy density at some point in space at some time. Uh, and so the rate of change of this density is given by divergence of a current. And so if you use the fact that the current is given by uh, this Fourier's law, then using this uh, equation uh, and these two equations, you basically find that uh, the temperature of the system satisfies a diffusion equation, right? So what I did here is uh, plug in J equals to this here and then del epsilon by del T. Uh, so the epsilon is the energy density and it depends on temperature. So I can rewrite it as del epsilon by del capital T into del T by T. So C is the specific heat of the substance. And so this is uh, basically, it tells you that, uh, uh, so Fourier's law basically implies diffusive transfer of heat. Uh, and this basically means that if you take a hot object and uh, if you take a system in equilibrium, let's say at some temperature, and if you dump in some heat at some point, then it will spread uh, diffusively, right? So it's a slow spread. Diffusion means if you look at what is the, uh, how much has it spread in time T, then it goes as square root of T. Okay, so that's diffusive heat spread. Okay, so this is uh, Fourier's law. Uh, so uh, this has an interesting history. It's almost two, more than 200 years old. And uh, this was uh, like, uh, it's interesting that uh, it was the big, uh, like one of the first times people were using partial differential equations to formulate uh, physical problems. Okay, so th these equations were invented around that time. Uh, and with the aim of understanding physical problems. And uh, even so Fourier, of course, you all know, he invented Fourier transforms and uh, he did a lot of other uh, real interesting mathematics and but uh, largely driven by physics problems, right? And uh, proper problems in uh, nature. So there's a very nice article in Nature in 2018 uh, called Fourier's Transformational Thinking. Uh, you might want to read it. Uh, okay, so one of the interesting early applications of Fourier's law was by uh, Kelvin in 1862. Uh, and so there, at that time, one of the big questions was, of course, I mean, was uh, how old is the planet Earth, right? I mean, so now, of course, we know some, maybe it's, uh, okay, what, I think it's 4 billion, maybe 4 billion years or something like that. But uh, how do you estimate that, right? So. Uh, obviously, it's a very hard question. And so uh, Kelvin came up with this idea 
that uh, what you can uh, ask is like uh, let's assume that uh, when the when earth started it was like uh, uh, so people had some ideas of how planets are formed so let's assume that it started as a hot ball uh, maybe of liquid at 3000 degree celsius and then uh, for a long time it cooled right so uh, it cooled and uh, so how does the cooling take place obviously the in the bulk of the system heat has to be conducted and then it radiates from the surface right so that's how it's cooling so now of course uh, how uh, how much time will it take to cool it depends on uh, how efficient is this uh, transfer of heat and uh, so he used uh, basically fourier's law to estimate uh, like how fast the heat flows and how much time it will take to uh, for the earth to cool from the uh, previous state to the present state okay so at present what we know about the earth for example is that there's a gradient at the surface of the earth if you go down like 1 km it it gets 20 degrees celsius hotter and uh, so this information they already had at that time and uh, using this present knowledge and uh, the model of this uh, conduction uh, kelvin estimated that the uh, age of earth was 200 million years okay so this was a big thing at that time because most people believe that it's like 6000 years or something and so this is saying something like that was quite uh, big but it just comes from some very simple principles so that's why it's uh, very nice okay so this is kind of uh, like uh, so of course uh, to solve the heat equation you needed fourier transforms and all these things were developed so it was really exciting okay now this fourier's law is it's a uh, what's called a macroscopic phenomenological law okay so temperature is uh, of course like you know all know that temperature it's a macroscopic object right you put a thermometer and measure it you don't care about what the molecules are uh, observing the molecules it's a macroscopic phenomenological law okay and uh, one of the main aim of a statistical physicist uh, so i am a statistical physicist is to derive such uh, macroscopic laws starting from microscopic laws uh, which means newton's equation or schrodinger's equation right and uh, so so it turns out that i mean this uh, simple macroscopic laws of physics kind of emerge kind of almost magically out of uh, like the very complex dynamics of uh, 10 to the power 23 atoms uh, which are doing some very complex chaotic dynamics and the main idea is that somehow the fact that there are a large number of molecules it simplifies things eventually and you are able to make uh, uh, able to make uh, very uh, very deterministic laws right fourier's law is a very deterministic uh, statement uh, even though the microscopic level it's there it looks like completely chaotic if you look at the molecules Uh, okay so now proving fourier's law which is a macroscopic law from first principles is uh, one such problem and th this is not uh, still completely solved okay so that's our main aim how do you derive this uh, phenomenological macroscopic law starting from microscopic uh, uh, dynamics uh, and here i'll talk just about uh, classical uh, physics you can also ask the same question you can do quantum mechanics and ask the same question Uh, okay so there was a old review article which really uh, got me excited about this problem in 2000 uh, uh, fourier's law challenge for theories and in this uh, article the authors had uh, offered a bottle of very good uh, wine to anyone who solves this problem and uh, so far it's not uh, still completely uh, solved okay uh okay so uh, now let's see what is the basic problem so um, i guess most of you have done some course in uh, statistical physics uh, and where you start by uh, doing equilibrium uh, statistical mechanics and there the basic idea is that if you have a system composed of a large number of uh, atoms uh, then there's a very well described uh, uh, theory due to boltzmann and gibbs which basically uh, takes uh, makes us look at a uh, system from a kind of ensemble point of view and uh, so instead of looking at the how this 10 to the power 23 molecules are evolving in some phase space you ask for the distribution of this uh, phase space points uh, and uh, the basic idea is that it's described by what is known as a, as a microcanonical ensemble okay so you say that uh you just uh, let's say the point can be on the surface of uh, on this energy surface with uh, equal probability 
so that's this function, uh, delta function on the energy surface. Uh, and then uh, you compute this uh, entropy function, which is just counts the number of the volume of this energy surface. And from this entropy, uh, where you don't care about all the microscopic de details. So once you have a Hamiltonian of a system, uh, this is this prescription to compute this entropy. And then this entropy is just a function of, let's say for, an, for if you have a gas in a box, it's a function of the volume of the box, the number of particles and energy. And from this, uh, just uh, from this one function, you can compute all of thermodynamics, okay. So if you're interested in what is the equation of state of the system, what is the specific heat susceptibility? So these are equilibrium properties of the system and you can compute everything. Now for non-equilibrium processes, and these are things like uh, heat transport, uh, electrical transport, uh, Brownian motion, uh, then if you want to understand things called active matter and so on. Uh, these are all non-equilibrium systems where things are changing with time. And uh, so for such systems, there's no equivalent uh, theory. There are a lot of uh, theories, but uh, uh, there's nothing equivalent to this uh, theory of Boltzmann and Gibbs. Okay, so in particular, we do not have uh, this theory of ensembles and we do not have an entropy function. So therefore, that's why uh, transport problems are much more harder than uh, problems in equilibrium. Okay, so of course, there are some theories of uh, heat transport and maybe some of this you have seen, at least kinetic theory, I assume that most of you uh, might have seen in some form. That's the most basic theory of uh, transport. Uh, yeah. And then there are more uh, advanced theories, uh, which are not completely microscopic, but uh, at some level they are, uh, they start from, they have, uh, they start from a microscopic point. Okay, so there's something called Boltzmann theory and then green Kubo linear response theory and then uh, Landauer theory. Okay. So I'll briefly talk later about uh, Landauer's theory uh, a bit. Uh, but not much uh, about the other uh, theories. But okay, so let's just uh, briefly talk about kinetic theory. Uh, any questions actually? No, not at this point. No, okay. Uh, okay, so uh, let's look at a solid uh, and let's look at uh, what's a dielectric crystalline solid. So there are no free electrons, so it's, uh, I am not uh, talking of metal. So in metal, of course, the electrons are conducting heat, but I'm uh, talking of a dielectric crystalline solid where, uh, so basically uh, you don't have free electrons, you have uh, ions sitting on a crystal and the electrons are all bound together. And then if you uh, heat one end and the cool uh, and the other end is cold, then the way heat goes is basically you can imagine that the uh, molecules at the hot end are vibrating much more than the ones at the cold end. So this vibration basically gets transmitted and this vibration is like a wave or uh, this is what are known as phonons. Okay, so you can think of like phonons are created at the left end and somehow they uh, move to the right end, right? That's, the, uh, that's what lattice light, light vibrations are. And what kinetic theory says is that uh, basically you uh, think of this phonons as doing, um, let's say phonons are being generated from this hot end and then they are, they get scattered by all sorts of things uh, inside the solid. So they are doing a random work. Okay. And then uh, so they somehow manage to go, the hot phonons manage to go to the other end. And you can ask what is the net current flowing at, let's at this point X. So the current is of course proportional to the velocity of these carriers times, uh, okay, so here I've written like epsilon X minus V tau. So let's say I'm looking at this point X. So typically I'll find that uh, phonon uh, has come from the left end at from some distance X minus V tau. Okay, so tau is like the mean time to get scattered. So it comes from a distance X minus V tau and uh, it carries energy per unit time V into the energy density. Okay, so it's like, uh, that's the current from this end. And this is the current from the right side phonons. Okay, and so the net current is just the difference of these two. And if you do a Taylor expansion of uh, this energy density around this point, then you get uh, something like this. And you see that you already get a derivative in uh, temperature, right? So that's what you, so the current is proportional to the derivative in temperature. And then this proportionality constant out here, it involves the velocity of the phonons, the time uh, between collisions and the specific heat of the phonons, okay? 
so uh, so this is this three things together will give you uh, the conductivity so v times tau velocity into the mean free path also gives you what is known sorry uh, velocity into the mean time between collisions gives you a mean free path okay so this gives you the thermal conductivity of the material so it looks like you can derive uh, fourier's law from this kind of a picture uh, but this is not really microscopic derivation right because i have assumed that the uh, uh, heat carriers are doing a random walk so but i have to really prove that and i have to start from a completely microscopic picture so this is a heuristic picture and uh, uh, so but it at least gives me some idea of what's going going on okay then there are other approaches like i said boltzmann's uh, kindrick theory so here i looked at phonons at a particular frequency and uh, then what i needed to calculate the thermal conductivity is the velocity of these phonons their mean free path and the specific heat of each phonon okay now if uh, in a real solid i have phonons of all frequencies there is a spectrum of phonons so i have to integrate over all these fre fre frequencies and that gives me uh, this formula okay so for the uh net uh, con conductivity of the solid okay so uh, so then of course the main things the difficult things are that how do you compute the mean free path and this uh, this you have to do with some sort of like fermi golden rule or something to cal cal calculate this kind of objects the mean free path of phonons and so on do perturbation theory basically starting from a hamiltonian okay so that's the connection between uh microscopics and macroscopic so it's, it's not completely microscopic right because i made some assumptions already but there is some connection to a hamiltonian uh, in that i have to calculate this mean free path from a given hamiltonian okay so this is uh, boltzmann theory and then there's something called linear response theory which basically tells me that the conductivity can be cal calculated by something called a, a current current correlation function uh, that is computed in equilibrium okay so i won't uh, go into but this is one of the powerful theories of transport uh, i won't uh, discuss it too much okay so now uh, basically i want to ask uh, if you wanted to start from scratch uh, what is the most direct way to prove or verify fourier's law uh, which is this law that the heat current is proportional depends on the temperature gradient okay uh, from microscopic equations okay so this is uh, so let me not talk about this Uh, so this is uh, uh, what you would do okay so let's uh, i'll talk uh, mainly of uh, about one dimensional systems so let's say i take a wire uh, which has this uh, molecules uh, so the length of the wire is l and there are capital n number of molecules and this um, uh, system is described by this hamiltonian where uh, each particle has this kinetic energy and then there is some nearest neighbor interaction between the particles and there might be an external potential also acting on each particle okay so this is the hamiltonian that describes this system uh okay now uh so now uh, when i connect it to heat paths i have to describe the heat paths in some way and uh, uh and uh, one way to do it is uh, is to uh, use something called langevin equations okay so basically what uh, i when i write the dynamics of this uh, the microscopic dynamics of the entire system i will say that each of these particles inside they satisfy just the usual newton's equation so mass into acceleration equals to force this is the particles from 2 to n minus 1 these are the bulk particles but the first particle has an extra so this is just newton's force and then there's an extra term which involves a dissipation and a noise term okay so this is called a langevin heat path okay and basically uh, this particle is interacting with the heat bath and you can show that uh, the effect of the heat bath because the heat bath itself has a large number of particles right but you can uh, kind of integrate out the effect of the bath and you can show that effectively what the bath does is that it uh, the system uh, effectively has this kind of uh, equation of motion okay so there's a damping term minus gamma v this is like uh, usual stokes einstein damping force and then there's a noise okay and the noise strength depends on the temperature of this bath okay so this eta l is what is known as a white noise uh, it's uncorrelated gaussian noise and uh, the noise strength is related to dissipation and this is called fluctuation dissipation relation and what this uh, this kind of uh, langevin term what it does to a system is that uh, for example if i didn't have uh, this bath supposing i just had one bath okay and i uh, ran this dynamics 
then it's automatically ensured that the, this entire system will actually reach thermal equilibrium at long times at, at this temperature, okay. So, but, but now what I'm doing is I'm putting one temperature at this end and the, uh, uh, a different temperature at the other end. And then I drive this dynamics, okay. So it's now a completely microscopic uh, dynamics. Uh, and now of course, what I have to do is uh, I take a very long chain and then I want to test is Fourier's law true. So then of course, what I have to measure is what is the temperature across this system and what is the heat current, right? So this, these are things that I have to define. Now, temperature, of course, so you can imagine if I ask what's the temperature it at a uh, given point, it should just be the local kinetic energy, right? So now, of course, uh, if there are two different temperatures, we know that temperature is going to be different everywhere. And to find the local temperature, I should just find the mean kinetic energy of the particles here, and then kind of uh, use this equipartition uh, result, right? So this gives me the temperature at every point on this uh, 1D chain of uh, or this 1D gas of particles. And similarly, I can ask what is the energy current and the energy current it turns out is given by, uh, so if I look at locally, what is the energy going here through here per unit time? Uh, it's just the velocity of this particle times the force acting on uh, this particle uh, from the left particle, okay? So force times velocity is the rate at which this particle does work on this particle that's the rate at which energy flows through the system in this direction. Okay, so, uh, so what I have to do is I have to connect this uh, two heat baths to the system and then compute the average of these quantities. Okay, so I can imagine I can do a long time average of what is the mean kinetic energy and what is this mean uh, rate of uh, energy flow uh, in this direction. Okay, so I can therefore compute uh, both uh, energy current and temperature profile in the system. And now if I want to test Fourier's law, uh, okay, so if I connect a system of length L uh, and put a temperature difference delta T, then uh, what we know is that of course the current has to be proportional to difference in temperature. That is, uh, that just follows from basic linear response. Uh, now Fourier's law, what it implies is that this gradient of T means temperature difference by the length of the system, right? So. Uh, so it means two things. One is that difference in temperature, the current should depend on the difference in temperature and it should depend inversely uh, on the length of the system. Now this uh, inverse thing, this is kind of, it seems obvious, but actually it's very difficult to prove. And we'll find that it's probably not true in one dimensional and maybe two dimensional systems. Okay, so that's the, uh, that's what we'll call anomalous transport. Okay, so right now when I say uh, we want to, verify Fourier's law in a direct microscopic, uh, let's say numerical experiment, we will try to verify this law. Okay, so is the current proportional to one over system size? Okay, if, it, if this is true, then of course the thermal conductivity is given by J times L divided by delta T. Okay, so this is the thermal conductivity. Now, uh, so basically if you do a numerical experiment, uh, uh, what you have to do is you have to take, if you, because this is a macroscopic law, so you need a large number, okay? So if you take a small number of particles, you don't see any, uh, you don't expect to see Fourier's law, but as you take larger and larger uh, number of uh, particles and measure the current, then you ask whether as L goes to infinity, this quantity goes to a constant or not. Okay? So if it goes, that means it's uh, the thermal, con there's a finite thermal conductivity and Fourier's law is valid. Okay, so now people have been studying this problem for uh, maybe 50 years and uh, there are a lot of simulations and now and also some exact results in one and two dimensional systems. And what is found is surprisingly that Fourier's law is in fact not probably generally valid in one and two dimensional systems. And uh, which means that uh, this thermal conductivity which is supposed to be an intrinsic material property is, uh, is not so. And it actually, uh, in, it changes as you increase the uh, size of the system. Okay, so right now the belief is that the thermal conductivity diverges as uh, L to the power some power. It's probably one third out here in one dimensional systems. In two dimensional systems, it's supposed to be logarithm of L and in three dimensional systems, it's supposed to be finite. Okay, so uh, let me talk about some, uh, what is the time? Okay, sorry, I got it. Uh, okay, so, uh, so now is this just theoretical or uh, is there some experimental verification? So 
I mean, after these theories were pr proposed, uh, people did experiments. And uh, I will say there are not uh, too many experiments, but at least there are some uh, few experiments which have uh, shown that indeed there's a violation of uh, breakdown of Fourier's law in uh, systems which are like one dimensional, for example, nanotubes and uh, uh, nano wires. So this is an experiment in 2008 uh, and basically uh, suspended uh, uh, nanotube and you put two different temperatures at these two ends and you measure the heat current, okay? And then the conductivity. And what they found is that as you take longer and longer uh, wires, the conductivity increased with uh, system size. Okay, so this was the one of the first experiments. And uh, then more recently, uh, there was this other experiment 2017. So one of the difficulties both in uh, simulations and experiments is to get uh, large enough samples. Okay, so in 2017, this was really uh, quite an amazing experiment. They made a nanowire which is like two uh, millimeters long and did this experiment of uh, measuring the thermal conductivity. And again, they saw this diverging uh, conductivity. So here you see that kappa goes as maybe L3 or 0.2. Now this power uh, in the experiment, it all uh, depended on the sample and it's not very clear. Uh, and uh, so, but th in theory, of course, there's a definite prediction, but experimentally it's uh, still not uh, completely clear. Okay, the other experiment is on uh, graphene. Uh, people have made similar experiments and there's some evidence, it's not conclusive, that uh, it's known that graphene has a really large thermal conductivity and perhaps actually diverges with the sample size. Okay. So here the kind of experiments people do is you take a graphene sheet and uh, basically you shine a tiny spot of uh, like uh, on a tiny spot, you put a laser, la like you pump, uh, pump in heat through a laser. Okay, so you put a lot of energy at some small point and just see how it spreads, right? So from the rate at which it spreads, you can measure, uh, you can extract the thermal conductivity and then somehow it look, it, there is, uh, from this experiment, you can see that there is this divergence of conductivity. Uh, this is another experiment on uh, length dependent thermal conductivity in suspended uh, single layer graphene. Uh, so here, uh, this experiment, this red and hot uh, blue regions are the, uh, are the uh, heat reservoirs and the graphene is really here. And again, they found this uh, uh, logarithmic divergence of thermal conductivity. Okay, so now let's, uh, I've talked about some experiments and I've given you some idea of like, what are the, what are the basic question and why is it is interesting? Of course, it's interesting because uh, I mean, that's, that's something everyone wants to do, derive uh, laws from microscopics. Uh, but it's also, I've tried to show, uh, show you, uh, tell you that it's relevant from, for experiments actually. Uh, and uh, now, okay, so, so now let's get to that, some of the details of what kind of models people have studied. So what are the simplest models you can think of if you want to prove such a thing, right? So of course in uh, solid state or condensed matter physics, always we start with things like a harmonic chain or a, or a chronic penny model, right? So, and we just want to understand that. So I'll tell you what happens in a harm, if you just take a harmonic chain, and uh, so harmonic chain means a set of particles which are connected by uh, just normal springs. And then you, at the two ends, you put hot and uh, cold reservoirs, okay? And you ask, you measure the current and ask how does it depend on system size. Uh, and then I'll talk about something called a disordered harmonic chain. So, uh, so in some ways I'll put in impurities in this model and ask uh, what happens to is Fourier's law valid? Uh, because you imagine that you want some scatterers. And then I'll talk of anharmonic uh, chain. Okay, so we'll start with the uh, harmonic uh, chain. Uh, again, I'll pause for questions. Uh, okay, no questions. There are no questions. Okay, so um, yeah, so I'll start with the uh, heat conduction in harmonic chains. And here there are some exact, you can get a lot of exact results using something called a Landauer formulation. And then I'll take or talk about an anharmonic chains where um, a lot of results are just from simulations. 
and then there's this recently developed uh, developed hydrodynamic theory which i this is really very interesting and i'll try to describe and then there's a sort of phenomenological description using levy walkers which are also i'll try to describe okay so you should remember this uh, one is a class of uh, harmonic chain models with or without disorder and and harmonic chains where uh, there's no disorder but the springs are non linear and uh, we want to see what is the effect of that okay so if you take a harmonic chain this is a problem that was studied in 1967 by these people uh, writer uh, lebois and lee uh, and they uh, so you, I, they took exactly the model that i described right at the beginning you take a, a system has the bulk of the system has some hamiltonian dynamics at the ends you have some langevin dynamics now this model they could uh, solve it exactly in some sense and uh, exactly means you can compute everything anything you want about this model and uh, in particular you can calculate the temperature how does it look everywhere in the system and what is the heat current okay and what they found surprisingly is that the heat current just depends on the difference in temperature it does not depend on how long a wire you have okay so uh, fourier's law say, says that the current should decrease with system size as 1 over n uh, but here you find that it uh, it as you increase the system it just stays constant okay uh, that's uh, the first property and the second property the temperature profile what you expect is that there should be if you put a hot end and a cold end at the two uh, ends then you should have a smooth profile in between right here what you find is that there are big jumps at the boundaries and then there's a completely flat temperature profile okay so it's very strange i mean the temperature is flat but you have a large heat current going through the system so this is usually called as by ballistic heat transport and uh, of course fourier's law is not valid in this system and this you can understand easily because uh, there's nothing to so you, what you should imagine is that from this hot ends you are throwing in phonons at all sorts of frequencies and then this phonons just go through the chain and uh, uh, deposit the heat at the other end okay so there's no scattering of phonons and because there's no disorder there's no anharmonicity uh, and uh, so that's why you get this ballistic transport now in real systems what you expect is that you should uh, you expect scattering of the phonons in two ways one is putting disorder and what i'll talk about is take a harmonic chain but make the masses random okay so that's like disorder and that's what you find in many solids like it is called isotopic disorder because different uh, typically if you take a solid uh, they are not all the same isotopes okay uh, and uh, so that's called disorder if i still have a harmonic chain but the masses are random and the other thing is usually called as phonon phonon interactions and this means that instead of taking a quad like the interaction to be a quadratic uh, uh, like x square you take anharmonic springs which means like x to the power 4 and so on okay so this kind of anharmonic spring models uh, one of the first most famous model is this uh, model called fermi pasta ulam and actually there's a fourth person singh hao uh, this fput mo uh, chain model uh, which was uh, studied of course first in the context of understanding why statistics equilibrium statistical physics works uh and uh, and uh, and more recently it has been uh, used to understand non equilibrium physics okay because it's the simplest and harmonic model you can think of okay so now i'll first talk of uh, heat conduction in disordered harmonic chains and uh, so this i have a set of particles each is connected by a spring uh, and uh, their masses are Uh, random okay so this green are let's say masses of particles 1 and red are particles of mass 2 and they are all randomly arranged in the lattice okay and then i have this hot end and cold end and for this kind of system the, you can write an exact formula for the heat current across this system and it's called a landau formula okay so i'll i, I won't explain what the, how this formula is derived but i'll just explain what it is so it's an integral in terms of all the frequencies and uh, there is this tau of omega so tau of omega is basically is like a transmission coefficient okay so it just says that if i send in phonons uh, across from one end of the chain what fraction is transmitted okay and uh, because there are no anharmonicities there is no new phonons can be generated the same phonon has to like it can get scattered but the same phonon has to be dumped at the other end okay 
So uh, then I just indicate over all the frequencies that this heat bath is sending. So this might be a black body sending out all frequencies and I just integrate over all the frequencies. And uh, this is the formula, okay. And you can write such a formula for a quantum system also. And in a quantum system, the only difference is, so this object is the same. And the only difference is that you say that the left path has some phonon distribution function and the right has some phonon distribution function. Uh, this is the usual thing. And uh, then you have the same formula. And there's H cross omega for each phonon, right? So this is the classical and quantum version of the Landauer formula. And for this tau omega, there's a prescription uh, how to compute it given, let's say the masses of all the particles, the string constants out here. So there's a formula which I'm writing here. Uh, it involves something called a Green's uh, function. So this is the mass matrix of the system. This is the force matrix. And then you have to take into account that there are these boundaries uh, which uh, are sending in, uh, which cause some dissipation in the system. Okay, so, uh, so basically in terms of this matrix, you can uh, write this object and uh, you can compute the current, okay. So this is the Landauer formula and we have an exact formula. Uh, and uh, now we want to understand uh, from this formula, we want to analyze it and see is Fourier's law true. Okay, so basically we have to, uh, what we want to ask is how does this transmission uh, of phonons depend on the uh, chain of the size of the chain, right? Because we want to prove that is J proportional to one over N. That's our goal. Uh, that's the minimal thing you want that Fourier's law true means the current should be proportional to one over N. Okay, so we want to find how does this transmission decay with uh, system size. Now for disorder systems, there's some very interesting physics uh, called Anderson localization, which comes into, uh, 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 which becomes relevant uh, for understanding this question. Okay, so what is Anderson localization is basically like whenever you have waves going in a random media, uh, you find that it's very hard for the wave to go. Okay, and they basically get localized at, in different regions of the system. And uh, this was first seen, okay, so, uh, so the basic idea is that if you take, a, so this is the Hamiltonian of the oscillator chain that I just talked about. Uh, so these masses are random, and then you have some on-site springs and you have interparticle springs, right? This is just a harmonic chain Hamiltonian. So the randomness is these masses are, uh, let's say uniformly distributed between some quantities. And uh, when I say localization, it means that if you look at this model, uh, then you can, you know that this supports sound waves and you can construct what are the modes, normal modes in the system. Okay, and if you construct the normal modes, you'll find that the system, all the normal modes, they're not plane waves, but once you have randomness, they become like very localized objects. Okay, so now uh, this, and this is called Anderson localization and it was first discovered in electrons. So if you take electrons, let's say quantum uh, system with this kind of Hamiltonian, where you have this uh, P squared by 2M, so that's the usual kinetic energy of the electron, but it's moving in a random potential V of X. Okay, so if you have a periodic potential V of X, then you know, like you have maybe studied in solid state that you get these block waves, okay, which are extended solutions of Schrodinger's equation. But if you make, uh, make it like introduce any amount of randomness in this uh, potential, then you find that uh, instead of this uh, block waves, which are extended objects, all the eigenstates on the system become localized objects. Okay, so each eigenstate might be localized at different parts of your uh, entire system. So this is Anderson localization. I'm just showing you some pictures of what you'd get in a, a two-dimensional crystal. Uh, so if you have no disorder, then you'll, these are like, these are the sound waves, okay? So these are plane waves. If you have uh, uh, some amount of disorder, then you get, uh, these plane waves get distorted and what these are called diffusive modes. Uh, while if you have strong disorder, you find that the modes look like localized objects, okay? So if you take a solid and if you have disorder, basically every uh, excitation in the system is a localized object, okay? And now if you want to transport energy across this system is very hard. If you kick uh, somewhere here at this end, the, uh, I mean, it can't excite uh, all these uh, objects, okay? So that's why once you have a uh, disorder in a system, you have this Anderson localization and the system becomes an insulator. 
Okay, so uh, so basically, so basically, this is the idea that uh, this transmission uh, coefficient that I needed for computing the heat current, uh, that uh, what you find is that that uh, is uh, so earlier for the ordered crystal we found that if you send a phonon, it just goes nicely to the other end, right? Now what you find is that it's very hard for the phonon to go. It is like it. Uh, the transmission basically decays with system as you uh, as you go across the chain. Okay, so it decays exponentially uh, as you go across the chain, and so which means therefore the, it's very hard for the heat to go. Um, however, you find that at very low frequencies, somehow the phonons are still able to go, and in that case, uh, with this very low frequency phonons can still carry heat. And using this result, what you can uh, you can do some analytic computations, and uh, the final result is basically that uh, that the current depends on system size uh, in this fashion. It's not one over L, but some power one by two or three by two, and things are very sensitive to do the what you do at the boundaries. Okay, so if you fix the strings at the particles at the ends, you get some dependence. If you don't fix them, you get a different dependence. Uh, and the other thing is that if uh, if you if all the sites have some uh, external potential, they are pinned, then you find that there are no low frequency modes, and the current system becomes an insulator. Okay, so it the heat current decays exponentially with system size, and uh, so uh, yeah. So this is the uh, main result for disordered harmonic chains. Uh, almost all normal modes of the chain are localized. So for most no phonon, most of the phonons are localized and they don't carry energy. Low frequency of phonons can carry energy uh, and transmit some energy. Uh, and uh, then you find, but uh, basically Fourier's law is not uh, valid. Okay, so you don't get that the current is one over system size. Okay, so. Uh, yeah, so, uh, and if you have pinning, then you get a heat insulator. Okay, so now one interesting question is, uh, so far I've talked about completely, uh, uh, completely uh, harmonic systems. And uh, we saw that if you have uh, disorder and pinning, then you have an insulator. Okay, now you can ask if you introduce some amount of interactions, which means nonlinear terms in the Hamiltonian, which is uh, what I do here, uh, then what happens, right? And in that case, uh, you find, okay, so here what I'm plotting is results from simulation. You measure the conductivity for different uh, chains of different systems length, okay? N is the length of the chain and you just measure the conductivity. So this graph, uh, this plot out here, this tells you how uh, the current uh, changes when you increase system size. And uh, this result is for a system without any uh, anharmonicity. Okay, so this is a disordered harmonic chain with pinning, and you find that the current becomes extremely small as you increase system size. So the conductivity becomes extremely small. Okay, so which means that uh, it in fact goes down exponentially, and so it's an insulator. Now, as soon as you put the smallest amount of anharmonicity in this system, uh, you find that the current actually saturates to a constant value for large n. So this is what I would call a normal conductor. So this is Fourier's law is valid. So uh, any amount of anonymity gives you a finite conductivity. So there's a transition from an insulator to a metal with the smallest amount of interaction. Okay. So this uh, uh, means uh, so this field is actually right now a very active and uh, uh, lively area of research called mini body localization. Mostly studied in the context of quantum systems, where you find there also you can ask like if you take a system which is insulating because of disorder, and then you introduce interactions, what happens? Okay, so you introduce electron electron interactions maybe, and there you find that unlike in this classical case, um, in the quantum case, the system remains an insulator even if you uh, put in some amount of uh, uh, interactions. Okay. So that's called a many-body localized uh, state of a system. Okay. Uh, so many-body means whenever you have interactions, and interactions means anharmonicity. Okay. So uh, so maybe this is in the beginning it's confusing. Like there is always interaction, but when you have a harmonic interaction, you can go to what are known as normal modes, and the system basically becomes like uncoupled oscillators. Okay. 
So even though this is looks like an interacting system, it's called a non-interacting system. And things like anharmonic terms, like uh, power four or something, uh, they are called uh, interactions in the uh, in the uh, model. Okay, so uh, okay, so so far what I have discussed is uh, disordered harmonic chains. You get an insulator if you introduce interactions in the in such a system, uh, and there is spinning, then you get a normal conductor, and there's this dramatic transition. Okay, so now we will look at uh, the other class of very interesting systems where I'll, uh, I won't have any disorder. Now let's go to the system without disorder and look at just systems with anharmonicity. Okay, so remember anharmonicity, uh, it will uh, introduce interactions between phonons. Uh, so disorder in, uh, is like phonon hits uh, uh, some other uh, potential. Okay, so it's like an external potential while uh, anharmonicity is like it causes interaction between the phonons. Okay, and the question is like, uh, if we just introduce this interactions between the phonons, then is Fourier's law valid in such systems? Okay, and the sort of most uh, popular model that studied is this fermi pasta ulam singh uh, model, uh, where you take a harmonic chain and then you add this cubic and fourth power nonlinearities. Uh, and then there's this other model called phi four chain. So here the anharmonicity is in the interactions. Here the anharmonicity is in the onside potential. Okay. So Qs remember are the interaction between uh, is the position of particles. So this uh, is like a nearest neighbor interaction. This is like an external potential. Uh, this term. Okay. So in this model there are only uh, interactions between the particle. There's no external potential. Therefore the total momentum in this system is conserved. This momentum, uh, this system momentum, total momentum is not a conserve because there's an external potential. Okay, now this momentum conservation makes a big difference. And what you find is that uh, systems uh, without uh, momentum uh, conservation uh, in such systems, Fourier's law is valid. Uh, but systems where momentum is conserved, like this Fermi Pascal chain, there the thermal conductivity it diverges with system size with this power. So, uh, okay, so now let me just tell you quickly, like uh, how do you, uh, what kind of experiments or simulations do you do to test this, uh, this uh, to arrive at these conclusions? And there are two kinds of uh, uh, experiments that you can do. Uh, one are like open, uh, like closed system experiments and the other is called an open system experiment. Okay. So this is a closed system. You take a system in equilibrium and you dump in some heat and ask how does it spread? Okay, so if Fourier's law is valid, it spreads diffusively. If it's not valid, we'll see that uh, it spreads uh, super diffusively. Okay, and uh, so this is a closed system experiment. And then you can do an open system experiment where you take, a, take the system and connect it to cold and hot ends and measure the current and see if the current decays as one over L. Okay, and from this kind of studies, what people have found from the open system studies, you measure the conductivity and you find that it diverges with system size. One other very striking uh, proper feature of uh, this kind of anomalous transport is, uh, is that the temperature profile. So imagine if you, if you take a uh, system, if you take a rod and put the two ends at a very small temperature difference. Okay, let's say 10 degrees here and 11 degrees. And you measure the temperature inside. So what you expect is that the temperature profile should be linear, but in this kind of anomalous systems, you find that it, it's highly, uh, uh, it's non-linear profile with some singularities at the boundaries, okay. Uh, okay, then there are some other things which I, I will ignore. Uh, and for this other kind of systems, this closed kind of uh, systems where you dump in an energy packet and see how it spreads, you can ask how does the width of this packet spread and here you find it that it's uh, if x square goes as t, it's diffusion, but it goes as t to the power gamma with gamma greater than one. So that's uh, super diffusive motion. And uh, the other kind of studies that people do to understand uh, this kind of uh, systems is to look at what are known as uh, equilibrium space time correlations. Okay, so correlation functions are something that is widely uh, measured by physicists. And basically what a correlation function tells you is like, let's say you're measuring energy energy correlations, okay? So what this correlation function tells you is that take a system in equilibrium 
Now, a system in equilibrium means at the, at, if you go to the microscopic level, of course, there are fluctuations all the time, right? At some place, uh, maybe it heats up a lot. You don't see at a microscopic scale, but microscopically, some region might be very hot, and then it relaxes and gives away the energy uh, and so on. Okay, so there are always fluctuations, and you can ask, like, uh, how does this fluctuation decay? Okay, so if suddenly a hot spot develops in a system in equilibrium, how does this uh, decay? And you expect that the decay of these uh, spontaneous fluctuations in equilibrium should follow the same laws as the what you see in macroscopic uh, physics, right? So if you uh, the way heat spreads in a, uh, at a macroscopic scale, at the microscopic level, it should happen the same way. So therefore, uh, these correlation functions exactly capture these kind of things, like uh, how do these spontaneous fluctuations relax, okay? So this is the information in that is contained in space-time uh, correlation functions of equilibrium uh, in equilibrium. So you're still calculating things in equilibrium, but time-dependent and space-dependent correlation functions. And they can tell you a uh, lot of things about transport properties. Okay, so uh, these are the uh, kind of two, uh, and then there are all these green Kubo formula and so on. Uh, and so these are the two kinds of studies that people do to understand, uh, to see signatures of anomalous transport. Okay, so, uh, so this is uh, basically the point. And uh, just to give an example, uh, again, this is the Fermi Pastulum chain. Uh, and uh, if you, like I said, if you look at the temperature profile in the system, it has this uh, funny profile. Okay, this is, uh, I mean, very generic. Like even if you make very small temperature difference, you find that it is this curved profile. And at the ends, it's, it has some singularities. Okay, and then the conductivity with system size, instead of saturating to a constant value as you take larger and larger sam sample sizes, it increases as n to the power 0.33. Okay. So these are results from uh, simulation. So that's the first thing people did because you can't solve this analytically. Uh, okay, so now maybe I don't have too much time. So what I'll do is uh, add, uh, I'll skip some part and uh, I'll just tell you one kind of, uh, the, so there are a lot of simulations and then I said, uh, okay, maybe I, let me just uh, show this other study. So this is what you find if you put a heat pulse. So if you put, a, if you take a diffusive system, it spreads like a, a Gaussian function. Uh, you basically it spreads slowly and the size of the Gaussian is uh, changes linearly with time. But if you, in this fermi pastelulum chain, you dump in some energy, you'll find it spreads very much faster. Okay, It's not uh, ballistic, but it is uh, super diffusive. Okay, So it goes as x square, the width of this thing function goes as t to the power, some power greater than one. Okay, and then this function, of course, is not a Gaussian, it's a Levy distribution. Uh, and here I'm plotting the Levy distribution. It has power law tails at, which means it is, uh, it has, it decays very slowly, right? So Gaussian, of course, decays very fast, but this is actually decays extremely slowly. Uh, and uh, so that's a big difference. Okay, so this is how heat spreads in the FQ chain. Uh, okay, so, uh, so this is something I won't talk about, like uh, there's a phenomenological description using uh, this Levy walkers. And the basic idea is that uh, the particle is not doing a random walk, but is doing a Levy walk. Uh, but this description using Levy walkers is still phenomenological. Uh, what I'll tell you in the remaining, uh, okay, maybe can I take five minutes more? I think you can take 20 more minutes if you wish. Oh, really? Okay. Yeah, uh, sure. Okay, so then maybe I'll uh, talk a little bit about uh, this Levy Walker's uh, model. Uh, okay, so this I said, uh, so these are the two features I talked about. Non equilibrium uh, measurement, where you find this uh, funny temperature profiles and the conductivity keeps increasing with system size. And this closed kind of system uh, measurements, where you put in a little bit heat and see how it spreads, and you find it spreads very fast. Right, okay, so to understand this, people develop this Levy Walker's model. So, diffusion means that the heat carriers are uh, doing a random walk, but uh, so they are obviously not doing a random walk. So, it means uh, let's see if we can uh, 
to develop another sort of uh, heuristic model and this is the levy walkers okay so what is a levy walk so random walk is like at every time you uh, uh, cross a coin and if it's head you go to the right uh, and if it's tail you go to the left with equal probability right so that's uh, that's the random walk and after a long time you find that uh, because you keep moving uh, left and right you don't move very far you move kind of distance square root of t okay now in a levy walk what you do is uh, you again choose a direction randomly but you move for uh, some time tau uh, which is chosen from some uh, distribution uh, which has long tails okay so you you might uh, so even though you move in a random direction sometimes you might move a long distance sometimes you may move a lot short distance and this this is chosen from some distribution pi of tau okay and then of course you are doing uh, randomly in both directions and uh, then you can ask the same question after time tau how much have i uh, moved okay so this was invented by the, uh, paul uh, levy he was a mathematician and uh, and uh, so here i'm plotting you know if, if you do it in one dimension uh, this is how a, a position of a random walker is this red line with time uh, that's how a random walk goes and this black line is the levy walk okay so you can see that it does does much more ex long ex excursions okay and in a given of amount of time the, so after some time t the random walker typically will move some square root t distance while this one will move like t to the power maybe 3/4 or something okay so it's uh, it spreads more than a, a, a random walk okay so this is how it spreads uh, and uh, okay now for this model uh, if you uh, so now we are saying that uh, a heat is basically being carried by this levy walkers okay and then you can ask like if you have a bunch of uh, at, there is some density of levy walkers and Uh, there's more levy walkers in some place and low density of levy walkers in some region how does it spread okay so there's going to be a current but what you find is that the current is is not like this it's not a local law uh, it's it has this non local dependence on so it dip, the current at a point x depends not just on the gradient of the density gradient of the uh, walkers at that point it it's uh, it depends on the density gradient at some other point okay so it's a non local response okay so it's still linear response but non local uh, response okay so uh, and uh, if you use this model then you find that you ex can explain you get this power laws in conductivity and then you can uh, so this is the temperature profile from a levy walk model and this the fpu chain okay so you get exactly the same uh, physics from this very phenomenological idea okay and uh, i just want to say that there are some mi completely microscopic uh, systems where uh, but stochastic models of uh, microscopic models for which you can actually derive this uh, uh, levy walker picture completely uh, mathematically okay and finally what you find is that this levy walkers uh, they actually uh, so if you look at how the temperature evolves so instead of a diffusion equation it satisfies what's called a fractional diffusion equation so where this power is not del square t but it's some power 3/4 and the meaning of this what is the fractional power is just means in if you do in fourier space it just uh, is something like this okay so it comes just comes from the mathematics so this simple uh, model can explain a lot of the phenomenology okay so finally i'll just talk about this uh, i mean can we get a more microscopic understanding right because we want to relate uh, the hamiltonian to uh, so we have done simulations to, with the hamiltonian and we get all these things and then we have this levy walkers picture but now uh, uh, can we get a more uh, like uh, can we really understand why we get anomalous transport why is fourier's law not valid okay so now uh, there is this uh, idea of using something called nonlinear fluctuating hydrodynamics Uh, to explain this uh, anomalous transport and this is what i'll explain so the basic idea of hydrodynamics is that uh, you forget about the all the molecules and uh, in uh, so you take a fluid let's say uh, you don't look at microscopically but you look at the conserved quantities in the system okay so typically the conserved quantities are let's say the mass or total number of particles the momentum and energy right these are the main conserved quantities and uh, they form the three conserved fields and you write equations for this 
And then we'll see that from these equations, you can make predictions for equilibrium correlation functions. Okay. Uh, so earlier I said that equilibrium correlation functions basically contain information about uh, how fluctuations decay in a system, uh, and that has information on anomalous transport. Okay. So basic idea is that use hydrodynamics to compute correlation functions. Okay. So this is what I'll try to describe very briefly. Uh, so this was actually uh, first proposed by people at ISC. Uh, so uh, Anuttam Narayan, who is right now at uh, UC Santa Cruz, and Sriram Ramaswamy in 2006, they actually uh, proposed that maybe you can uh, use hydrodynamics to uh, understand uh, uh, anomalous uh, transport. And then more recently, 2012, uh, Henk Van Bejeren and then Herbert Spohn uh, so Herbert Spoon really has uh, developed this subject uh, very uh, uh, in a massive way, uh, making it uh, very uh, like uh, also in uh, making it widely applicable to large class of systems and making it more uh, uh, like a, a very formal framework of doing uh, fluctuating hydrodynamics. And uh, this uh, part for this was part of this work was awarded with this Boltzmann uh, uh, award, right? So let me try to explain uh, what this uh, nonlinear fluctuating hydrodynamics is. So basically, the idea is that uh, what is hydrodynamics about? Uh, so basically, I mean, there's this microscopic description of a system. Let's say you have a 1D gas, and these are the molecules, uh, and the molecules are described by a position Q n and a momentum P n. And uh, th and then of course you have a Hamiltonian and you have uh, Newton's equations, right? These are Newton's equations for this system. Uh, this is the microscopic description. Now there's a macroscopic description where you uh, kind of uh, look at a coarse grain level. So you look from far, you can't see the molecules. And, but what you can uh, measure maybe is like in, there's a macroscopic length scale L, uh, which still is small compared to the entire room, let's say but it still contains maybe 10,000 particles, right? Because this room has 10 to the 23. So even if you take some length scale like a micron that contains already thousands of particles. So it is small at a macroscopic scale, but it's large at a microscope level. Now this has a large number of molecules and you count, uh, you uh, construct these fields uh, and these fields are constructed depending on what are the conserved quantities. Okay, so somehow the uh, in a system, uh, like uh, finally it turns out that all these uh, microscopic details are not important and what is really important are the conserved quantities okay so uh, you have number momentum and energy and you uh, count the number of particles the total momentum in this box and the total energy in this box and you construct these three fields okay so you construct these three macroscopic fields and this provides you the macroscopic description okay. so of course for each macroscopic description there is a large number of microscopic configurations and uh, and uh, this is the microscopic equations and then hydrodynamics tells you how this macroscopic fields evolve okay so we have these three uh, uh, conserved fields and uh, hydrodynamics tells you and uh, basically the equation is what uh, maybe uh, many of you have heard of this it's called the navier stokes equation so normally this you hear in three dimensions but it's the same in a one dimensional system and uh, these are the three equations for the three conserved quantities uh, uh, that uh, uh, you write, okay. So, uh, okay, so here these equations, okay, so maybe I won't give go into the details, but uh, basically there are, uh, this term is like a viscosity and there's a heat conduction term and so on. Okay, now, uh, so this equation is, uh, requires some microscopic input and the microscopic input is like, you need things like the, uh, how does the energy depend on uh, uh, density and temperature? How does the pressure depend on density and temperature? So to solve these equations, you need all this microscopic information, which uh, require you to solve equilibrium statistical physics. And then you have this transport coefficients, uh, the viscosity and the thermal conductivity, uh, which uh, you also can try to derive from microscopics, right? Okay, so now these equations are usually tell us, for example, how if you have a tube and water flows through the tube, these equations are sufficient. 
uh, and uh, but uh, what we'll see is that these equations can also be used to derive uh, equilibrium correlations. Okay, so uh, okay, so maybe just a point that these equations have the form of conservation laws, uh, like all of these have this uh, form. Okay, and uh, now the basic idea of fluctuating hydrodynamics is that, uh, so like I said, these equations you can apply in two ways. You can apply it to study things like uh, you take a tube and there's a pressure head and water is flowing, but you can also look at the system in equilibrium. And uh, so there's no flow of uh, fluid or anything. It's in equilibrium, but you can ask like, uh, if you look closely now, uh, there are fluctuations. And can I describe these fluctuations using this uh, core screen? Uh, Fields. Okay, so to do, do that, what you do is add fluctuations in the hydrodynamics and you add this uh, noise terms. Okay, so, uh, so maybe I won't go again into the details, but basically this is called fluctuating hydrodynamics. And uh, uh, using this, this equation, these are just some partial differential equations with noise. You can somehow solve them and uh, you can make predictions for uh, equilibrium correlations. And from this correlation, okay, so, uh, so the basic prediction it can make is that, uh, like, uh, what it says is that, uh, okay, so maybe let me go to the next slide where I uh, tell you numerically what is the prediction, okay. So, supposing you take this Fermi plus the Ulam chain uh, in equilibrium and you just dump some energy at the center, okay. So, what you'll observe is that. Uh, the you know, if you dump start with some lot of energy at one point, the energy uh, spreads uh, like part of the energy is this peak out here, but part of it just moves like uh, as sound waves. Okay, so part of it moves like ballistically and is a sound modes, and part of it is heat mode. Okay, so this is how sound spreads. Okay, again here I've done the same thing, and uh, what this uh, high fluctuating hydrodynamics tells me is uh, what is the form of this function and what is the form of this function, okay? And uh, basically it says that this function is a Levy distribution and this function is something called a KPZ uh, function, okay? So uh, again, I won't go there into the details, but this is the prediction and you can test this. So this is some simulations which test uh, this fact. So you have this, uh, so this, are, uh, so this, let me just state what the experiment is again. You take a long chain, you put in some heat energy at the center at time t equal to zero. Then at time 800, you find that it looks like this. So a lot of energy here and here, and uh, some energy is like here. Then at time 2400, the energy uh, is gone here, here, and then some is spreading. Okay, so some of it's spreading slowly, some of it is spreading uh, ballistically. Okay, and then at time 3200, it's like that. So now you can ask, like, if I just look at these peaks and bring them together, then they kind of scale nicely. And they, uh, you, if you do some scaling, they collapse into one curve. Okay, so this is what I've done for uh, the uh, for this central peak. There are three peaks, and I do some scaling, and they collapse into one curve. And this curve is actually exactly a Levy distribution. Okay, and uh, these three curves, if I bring them together, they collapse and they form what is called a KPZ function. Okay, so KPZ is some Tartar, Paris, Zang. It's a completely different uh, model. And somehow this uh, heat conduction model maps into this other model of uh, statistical physics. Okay, and uh, because you get this Levy distribution, it's so you can uh, imagine that there is some connection to anomalous heat transport and so on. Uh, and uh, so that is the basic idea. Okay, so. Uh, yeah, so maybe let me just uh, try to conclude. Uh, so what I've tried to show, show you is that uh, deriving uh, Fourier's law rigorously is a surprisingly hard problem. And actually it seems that this law is not even true in low dimensional systems, and this is called anomalous heat transport. So this is surprising because the thermal conductivity, normally you expect that it should be an intrinsic material property. Uh, example, this is what you read in a textbook. But what you find is that for low dimensional systems, not for three dimensional systems like by diamond, but low dimensional systems, maybe it doesn't even make sense to talk of thermal conductivity uh, because it depends on how large the sample is. 
Okay. And then I've tried to explain this, uh, that you can't use this diffusion equation. You have to replace it by this fractional diffusion equation. How does heat spread? And uh, then I tried to explain that there is a lot of progress using something called nonlinear fluctuating hydrodynamics. And uh, some of the interesting open questions are, uh, so I briefly talked about this effect of localization. And uh, uh, so this is this area called mini body localization and uh, it's still a lot of open questions. Uh, quantum effects are of course interesting. And uh, then the most interesting question of course is, like most of the models I described, like this Fermi bus, the Elam chain and so on, they are really toy models. But if you look at a nanotube, it's much more complicated, right? The Hamiltonian is much more complicated. And to really uh, do the same kind of analysis for those kind of models and get predictions, that is one uh, uh, important pro remaining problem. Okay, so uh, yeah, so that's all. Uh, and uh, yeah, these are like uh, collaborators over the last many years. Uh, so I'll take questions. Hi, yeah, there are quite a few questions now. Um, Ranjuna asks, why thermal conductivity shows a logarithmic dependence on size in graphene? Uh, okay, so why is like, this is what, you get from the theory uh, and uh, basically like I said that uh, the yeah so I mean see this is what you get if you just uh, do these studies that in one dimension it goes as some power law in two dimensions, it grows logarithmic. Okay, so the one way to understand log is maybe if I look at a simpler problem. So maybe some of you have heard that in uh, one and two dimensions, you cannot get a crystal because of uh, something called marmin wagner theorem, which basically says that uh, in one dimension, they're like, okay, if you make a crystal, but then what happens is there's a lot of uh, thermal fluctuations, okay? And in one and two dimensions, these thermal fluctuations are large. And uh, 1D, the RMS fluctuation goes as uh, square root of N, where L is the length of the system. In 2D, it goes as log L, okay? So of course, uh, in an experiment, it's hard to see because like if you take graphene, of course, we see the crystal all the time, right? So why is this, uh, uh, why is, uh, what does it mean? So uh, theoretically, you don't expect a crystal, but experimentally, we all know there's a, uh, crystal. So the thing is that, of course, log is a very slow divergence. Uh, so it might, uh, it's hard to see even in an experiment. Okay. So now in thermal conductivity, it's a similar reason. Okay. So you, you have to do a complicated calculation and you get log L. Uh, yeah, I can't give a simple answer why log L, but this is what the theory uh, and uh, simulations give you. And like I said, there are uh, maybe just one or two, two experiments maybe which indicate that this is indeed true. Yeah, I hope that answers your question, Ranjana. Uh, Vibhav asks, what are phonons? What are phonons? Okay, so phonons are like, okay, so if you take, uh, let's say what, I mean, see, if you, for example, there is this simple experiment, maybe if you have gone to a museum, you have seen, right? Like you take lots of pendula uh, hanging and they are coupled in some way. And then you kick at one end and you see a wave traveling, right? So it's, uh, so that's a phonon, I would say, I mean, at some frequency. So it's just a, a vibration of some coupled uh, oscillators. Uh, and it's a wave, basically it's a wave phenomena, like you, kick one end and then you see a wave traveling at some frequency and wavelength and uh, that's called a phonon. Thank you. Sharmadeep asks, does such transport take place in low dimensional lattices like QD lattice structure? Like what lattice structure? QD. Uh, what is UD? QQ. QD. Queen. Queen Delhi. QD. Shamini, could you unmute yourself and ask, please? Hello, am I audible? 
Yeah, we can hear you. Oh, I just meant like uh, quantum dot lattices. Oh, quantum dot lattices. Okay. Uh, uh, see, I mean, of course, if you take a quantum dot lattice, uh, doing heat conduction in that is kind of very difficult because uh, you can do what uh, uh, basically it's usually a system which is uh see i mean the simplest experiment you can do is like if it should be kind of a suspended uh, maybe nano wire okay but if you uh, like quantum dot experiments typically they are built on a substrate and there's heat loss from all sorts of uh, ways right so i would imagine that it's uh, i mean uh, it would be very hard to do this kind of measurements in such systems uh Right. Yeah. I, I mean, uh, uh, yeah. People have taken molecular wires and done these experiments uh, of uh, measuring conduction, but quantum dot chains. I think it's difficult. Yeah. The next question is: How does thermal conductivity change with dimensionality of the system? Uh, yeah. So in uh, okay, maybe I have a slide. Let's see. So in uh, higher dimensions, you do find that uh, you get a thermal finite thermal. Okay, so this is some result uh, paper that we uh, st we studied heat conduction in one D, two D, and three D. So in three D, actually, you find that uh, it does go to a finite. Uh, so there's no problem. Fourier's law is valid always uh, in three dimensions. In uh, one dimensions, it diverges. Two dimensions, it's a very weak divergence. Uh, but in three D, it's always finite. And in relation to that, he also asks, how does confinement of systems affect conductivity? Yeah, so confinement, like I said, I mean, one of the important things uh, for uh, anomalous transport is that it should be momentum conserving. So uh, if you have confinement, I would imagine that uh, somehow uh, the, if, the, if, if, the, if due to confinement, momentum conservation goes away, then again, you will recover uh, Fourier's law and it should be a normal conductor. And does electron phonon interaction affect thermal conductivity? Electron, uh, yes, of course. I mean, so. Uh, yeah, so normally if in a uh, if you take any solid and ask, uh, uh, let's say, three-dimensional solid where all these problems of uh, anomalous transport does not exist, there, if you are looking at, uh, like, okay, so there, let's say, you are think purely in kinetic uh, theory picture. So the phonons are moving, and then you ask, uh, like, what are the things that scatter phonons? So one is phonon-phonon interactions, and then, of course, electron-phonon interactions is a, a, another reason for scattering the phonons. And so, yes, they will contribute to the mean free path. Okay. And in, there are cases where that might be the dominant, uh, uh, dominant uh, uh, thing which affects transport. Rishik asks, what are the length scales of non-local interactions in levy box? Uh, See, the levy walk is something which really is because uh, the lens, uh, the, uh, so the phonon can uh, basically uh, take a mean free path, which is chosen from a power law. Okay. And because it's a power law, so power law usually means there's, the, the, there's no uh, length scale in that sense. Okay. So, uh, so in such systems, the only, the final length scale would just be the system size. That's the only length scale which affects the uh, the uh, mean free path of the phonon. Uh, but uh, so the, in for the, as far as the Levy walk model is concerned, there's no length scale. And uh, in a uh, in an experiment, the length scale in such a case would be just determined by the system size. Ah, okay. So Subhajit Sinha asks if we place a two D material in high magnetic field. We have 1D edge channels in the quantum hall picture, which are dissipationless. Which model of heat transport is applicable in this quantum hall regime? Uh, 
Okay, so if you are if you have transport along the edge, edge, uh, yeah. So yeah, I'm not really sure. I mean, uh, th because these are uh, uh, so typically, of course, people like uh, let's say now uh, Hall effect measurement, you can. Uh, Measure the so I guess the question is because it looks like a one D uh, transport. I mean, is it? Uh, do you see this anomalous transport or not? A heat transport. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm not sure because here, okay. First of all, there. I mean, uh, in such systems. The heat is carried by both by electrons and phonons, so it's much more complicated. And then, um, yeah, so it's a it's a very complicated system. So I can't really say whether you'll get anomalous transport or not. Um. Okay. So next, uh, yeah, Shubhajit says thank you. And the next question is, um. Why are why does the Fourier law seem to be not valid in do, low dimensional systems? Uh, yeah, why? Well, so I mean, yeah. So of course, it's a surprise. It's in, that it's not valid, and the re main reason is somehow that in low dimensions, the phonons have uh, see somehow they uh, have these very long mean free paths. Okay, and. Uh, uh, and it's related to this. So, I mean, of course, mathematically we understand it from this hydrodynamic uh, theory, uh, which tells us that. Um, uh, so basically, the idea is in these systems, if you set a like, see, the part of the energy is being carried by the uh, this. Uh, it's almost like because of momentum conservation. Uh, part of the energy is just carried by, by the sound modes. Okay, so it's like in that plot I showed, uh, you can see that in these systems, when I uh, dump in energy, it uh, a lot of it is actually just dragged by this uh, long wavelength phonons. Okay, so I mean this is the basic I picture that uh, you have this uh, uh, sort of. Uh, so long wavelength means sound modes, and these sound modes are uh, the scattering in low one dimension is very weak, so they can uh, kind of they just carry the heat very efficiently. Okay, so of course it was it's a big surprise when you uh, first find this, uh, but uh, I mean there's no sim I can't give a simpler explanation than this. The next question is. Uh... Shreshta and yeah, I think she defines a levy flight. So she says a levy flight is a random walk in which the steps are defined in terms of step lengths, which have a certain probability distribution with the directions of the steps being isotropic and random. Sir, here, can you explain the line directions of the step being isotropic and random? Because isotopic and random have different meanings, sir. So could you further clarify this sentence okay so uh, so i was talking of course 1d and isotropic just means that it can go left and right with equal probability uh, so that's random right isotropic means either direction or there's no favored direction that's what isotropic means and random means equal probability for both you can do it also in higher dimensions let's say in if you are in uh, two dimensions or three dimensions you choose a random direction, right? But all directions have the same probability. So in that sense, it's isotropic. So you choose any direction and then you go, uh, you do a step, then uh, you choose again a random direction and you uh, take a step. Again, you choose a random direction. So isotropic just means that all directions, no direction is favored. It's chosen uh, randomly, but uh, any direction is equally likely. Is, is that uh, make sense? Yeah, yeah. And 
Ranjana again asks, and I think this is the last question for the day. What is the basis of classification of 1D, 2D and 3D heat transport? How can we differentiate between heat transport in 3D and 2D? And if the material is 2D, can we call the heat transport as 2D? Uh, yeah, so of course, yeah, like I said, if you take graphene, uh, uh, that's a 2D material and that is, then I would call it 2D heat transport. I mean, there are some material like if you take the nanotubes, it's a kind of quasi wand in the sense that it, it is a tube really, right? So there is some width and so on. It's not exactly wand. So it's strictly wand is like if you just have a line of atoms. That, that that also there are experiments, but nanotube usually is like, uh, it's quasi 1D in some sense, okay. So uh, yeah, so when I talk of 1D heat transport, I just mean a chain of atoms and uh, it's like a polymer and I'm looking at uh, energy going through this object. Uh, 2D is like graphene, just one layer of atoms and I, uh, I put energy somewhere and I see how it spreads. So that's what I call 2D heat conduction and similarly 3D. And uh, then, so what was the original question? I, I don't know if I answered. Uh, how do I classify that? So that's how I classify, right? Yeah, yeah. There was one more question. Would you be all right taking that? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, so Mandu asks, presently the best generic microscopic theory to explain anomalous transport is that of nonlinear fluctuating hydromass. Hydrodynamics. What is it actually? What what is hydro fluctuating hydrodynamics? Okay, so basically uh, the this is uh, what I tried to explain. So what fluctuating hydrodynamics is says is that uh, you take a system and uh, instead of this kind of a microscopic description, uh, you do a hydrodynamic description. Okay, so hydrodynamic description you forget the atoms but look at the conserved fields. Okay. So, uh, and then write equations of motion for these conserved fields. So density, momentum, and energy. Okay, so th these are what you would typically measure, right? If you take a fluid, uh, you measure the velocity flow, like, uh, in, like for example, there's this Poisson experiment, right? You, uh, what are the things you can measure? You can measure the flow velocity, that's like momentum. Uh, you can measure the temperature, that's like energy, and you can measure the density of the fluid. So, and you can write uh, Navier-Stokes equation for those. So that's hydrodynamic e equations. So hydrodynamics, the microscope, of course, it's derived from completely Newton's equations, right? You can, so that's a difficult step. But supposing you just uh, assume that the same system that you have some microscopic model, now you describe it using hydrodynamics, okay? So, uh, and then you write this kind of equations. So there are three fields and you write this hydrodynamic equations. So these are basically because they are conserved quantities, they satisfy some sort of continuity equations. And uh, there are these currents, J rho, J, P and J, E. These currents are given by uh, various, I mean, okay, so I can't explain all this, but uh, yeah, these are basically Navier-Stokes equations, okay. Uh, so these are the, this is the hydrodynamic description of a system, which you can use to describe, like I said, normally you use it hydrodynamics to study things like, uh, uh, let's say, like I said, water flowing through a tube or things like turbulence and so on. But you can also study it to uh, answer questions about this, how do fluctuation, like if you dump in some energy, how does it spread, okay? So for that one additional state, so there is uh, uh, just hydrodynamics I, that maybe you all know. And fluctuating means you are looking at hydrodynamics of the system in equilibrium. And then you have to add these two extra terms. Okay, so these are noise terms, which tells that even if a fluid is at completely, uh, is at rest, there are things happening at the microscopic level. Okay, fluctuations are all the, there all the time. So you, you kind of describe it by these equations. And these noise terms have to satisfy some properties uh, like, uh, like this fluctuation dissipation theorem and so on. Okay, so these are the starting equations. Okay, so these are some, uh, so the same microscopic model, somehow you have, uh, you want to describe it by this uh, equations of fluctuating hydrodynamics. Okay, now you can, uh, there's a mathematical way to solve these equations and uh, calculate things called correlation functions. 
Okay, and uh, like I said, the correlation functions, if you calculate energy energy correlation, for example, it, uh, it has the same kind of information, for example, that, uh, uh, that uh, this plot had. Uh, sorry, so yeah, so basically it can, uh, it will look something like this. Okay, so this uh, particular plot. So it tells you how, uh, for example, if you're in a normal diffusive system, which Fourier's law is uh, satisfied, if you calculate energy energy correlation, it will show a diffusion kind of behavior. Okay, so the basic idea is that uh, uh, you, you solve these equations and you can compute correlation functions. These are the correlation functions, and uh, then when you plot these correlation functions, you would find that you get this uh, uh, that uh, the way heat spreads is that it has two components. One is uh, slowly spreading part which is a Levy distribution now, right? So uh, the fact that you get a Levy distribution, it already tells you that there's something anomalous about it. Okay, so this is the basic idea of uh, fluctuating hydrodynamics. Yeah, and uh, I think this will be the last question for the day. And that was about, uh, so are we considering bilayer or trilayer graphene? Like, are we considering graphene to be bilayer or trilayer? And would like, can we call it 3D or 2D with respect to heat? Uh, yeah, so actually there's an ex interesting experiment where the basically, uh, so the experiments I showed are single layer graphene, but there's an experiment, interesting experiment where they increase the number of layers. And as you increase the number of layers, you find a crossover from this strictly uh, 2D to this 3D behavior. Okay, so 3D, of course, you get normal transport. And uh, so there's one experiment like that, uh, where you actually increase the number of layers. And you, uh, of course, if you have many layers, now two layers, you might, you are not sure what to expect. But if you have 10 layers, you pretty much get like three dimensional uh, behavior. Uh, okay, so I should say that these experiments are extremely difficult and uh, one shouldn't read too much into what, uh, like how much you can, uh, like uh, trust uh, what they get, okay? Because uh, measuring heat, you can imagine, is really difficult. Like electric, uh, like uh, if you think of electric current, it's very easy. You take an am uh, ammeter or something and measure it. But heat current, there's no ammeter, right? It's very hard. Uh, so and there's radiation. You have to take care of lot a uh, lot of things and so on. So the experiment is really hard. And but uh, so uh, but yeah, that's the idea. Yeah, I think that's all the questions we will be taking for today. And I will now proceed. So we would just like to deliver a short vote of thanks. First of all, we would like to thank Professor Abhishek Dar for accepting our invitation and taking the time out of his busy schedule to give us this fascinating talk about the puzzles in the theory of heat conduction in low dimensional systems, as well as for talking about the anomalies in the one dimensional system. I think there were some interesting questions that we all get to think about now. Thank you for introducing us to these questions. We would also like to thank the Dean of the UG program of IISC, Professor P.S. Anil Kumar for making this talk possible. We would like to thank Team Pravega for supporting and helping us in the organization of the talk, as well as the IT department for ICPS for providing us the Zoom uh, license to do this talk. And lastly, we would like to thank all of you for attending this talk and we hope you enjoyed it. If you did, Pravega is hosting a bunch of other talks for you, which you can check out at pravega.org. As for coherent lecture series, we will be back on 9th October, that is Friday, 5 p.m. Indian Standard Time, with the next talk being given by Professor Rama Govindarajan from the International Center for Theoretical Sciences, Bengaluru, on the topic, anything that flows can be studied. Till then, goodbye and take care. Okay, thank, thank you. you. Thanks.